It's that time, people. This is Tommy Canelli. Welcome to Before the Lights podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. Make sure you check us out on the web at beforethelightspod.com and follow us on Instagram at Before the Lights Pod. Make sure you subscribe and share the show to everyone you know. Normally at this time, we ask you to grab a coffee, but with today's guest, throw the coffee out the window. Get yourself a good stiff drink. I mean, not a double, but a triple straight vodka and water. Go tell your family, friends, neighbors, and strangers. That's right, a stranger. It's time for an in-depth conversation with our guest. And before I introduce our guest, today's show is brought to you by DaviesGirlsPhotography.com. Check them out or reach out via email. We have all thankfully moved on from the days of Sears, JCPenney portraits. Hell, I hope you have. Have you remembered those soft glam shots or those awkward family photos your mother insisted on you taking as a child? I have a few of those that will never see the light of day, and you probably do too. Times have changed, thankfully, so if you have an idea or a vision for your first 10th, 100th photo shoot, Davies Girls Photography can help bring your idea to print. To discuss your next idea, check them out at DaviesGirls.com or on Instagram at Davies Girls Photography. My guest today once ruled the L.A. Sunset Strip. He is a guitarist vocalist for the heavy metal band Steel Panther. He somehow has figured out to party all night, sleep till noon, and survive on pizza. On the phone, Satchel, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm, you know, this crazy uh, world we live in is um, everybody's sitting around doing nothing, and I appreciate you taking some time and uh, catching up with me. It's, you know, it's a crazy time right now. Everybody's holed up. You know, the government won't let you leave your house. <laughs> it's a good thing for me. They still got certain strip joints open down. In, you know, it's, it's, I, you can't live without strippers, right? What are you going to do? That's right. That's as right. As, stripper, as long as the strippers don't catch coronavirus, I'm good. <laughs> then you're going to catch coronavirus, and that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, as long as we don't have to stay six feet away during a lot of table dance, I'm good. That's great. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. So Satchel, I'm doing really good. You know, I'm hanging in there and enjoying uh, interviewing people for the podcast and uh, just yeah. having some laughs and talking with some people. Well, it's good. It's a great time to do interviews. Yeah. Phone interviews. Yeah. So tell me, when did you start playing the guitar and, and why the guitar? Well, I think why the guitar is, I mean, that's pretty obvious. Guitar is easily the coolest instrument. Uh, it's light enough so you don't have to carry, you know, drums are pretty heavy. You have to load them into the back of your truck. It takes time to break them down. You, you know, it, there's a lot more of them, and they're more expensive. Guitar, it's it, it looks killer. Uh, it sounds killer. Um, you can hang them on your wall, and they they look they make your place look cool, even if you don't know how to play them. So you know, a lot of people don't know what kind of art to put on on a wall. But if you if you have a bunch of guitars, you can hang them on the wall, and they look cool. This is true. But uh, I think I think the guitar is is to me it's just it's the most rock and roll instrument. I mean, you got drums and reggae bands and blues bands and and you know there's a lot of types of music that have drums and, and bass, but to me you know the guitar is the sound of of rock and heavy metal and uh, that's it. it I, you know what made me want to play the guitar was. I went to a Judas Priest concert when I was young, and before the band came on, the 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 um, guitar tech came out, and he just hit an A chord, but it was through a PA that was really loud, <laughs> and it it was it made me. Ch I at the time I was I was. I played violin. I was like, oh, this is, you know, I thought violin is cool. And I was, I heard an A chord through a PA system played by a, an old stone roadie. And I was like, that's the coolest instrument in the world. So um, that made me want to play the guitar and I haven't stopped since then. So. And you're very good at it too. 
Very good. Well, I appreciate that. And, That's and, all subjective, though. And, and, <laughs> but, and, and you're, I appreciate that. And you're right. <laughs> Guitars on a wall is cool. Even if you're not into music, you walk in, you're like, oh, wow, who's guitar? You know, it's, it's cool having a guitar on the wall. But uh, who are... If, you're, if you, bring, you bring a girl to your apartment and you've got guitars on the wall, you don't even have to plan. You're definitely going to get laid. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> who are some of your early influences? Well, let me think. That, you know, this, before I had even ever heard the name Richie Blackmore or Deep Purple, my, my cousins had played me, uh, you know, Smoke in the Water. And, and I think it was pretty much everything on the album Machine Head by Deep Purple. And so I knew that album, even though I didn't know they were called Deep Purple. Um, but And I loved it. So I think that was probably some of the first stuff I heard that, that I loved. And, you know, during, during the early early and mid seventies, you know, a lot of that really like black Sabbath. I had heard that I had older cousins that, that turned me on to stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, Kansas, you oh. know, a lot of, you know, stuff like that. When I heard uh, carry on my wayward son and the guitar riff in that, I was like, Oh my That's God, awesome. Uh, great, great instrument. And, and uh, I didn't realize that I wanted to play guitar, but I think even at the, at, you know, uh, at a very young age, I was like, "Oh, this is uh, something that I want to I, I want to hear more of." And, and uh, you know, the older I got, the more I got into um, <clears throat> there. There were, you know, more. There was the new wave of British heavy metal like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest, and I heard those guys. And I've been an Iron Maiden fan ever since I heard. Uh, you know, I think I actually got into them when Number of the Beast came out, but then I went and bought their first few records and. And uh, Judas Priest was a big influence on me. Uh, you know, I, I actually, when I started playing guitar, I, uh, I had a guitar teacher who then, you know, turned me on to some of the guys before, you know, before that, like, like Hendrix. And I think Hendrix is uh, probably, you know, there's no doubt that he, he changed the trajectory of guitar playing and and rock and roll like he was probably the most innovative rock guitar player ever and and um and he's still i mean he died when he was 27 and, and he's and he uh but you listen to Hen- hendrix and everything he played was was cool and tasty and awesome and uh so he was you know i got into him after i got into like guys like richie blackmore and Jimmy page and, and uh you know, Tony Iommi and, and of course, you know, the guys that are made, and of course, Eddie Van Halen, which, which, you know, you know, they, that first record came out in 1978, Van Halen won. And I remember hearing Eruption when I was, you know, before I had actually picked up the guitar and, and it, it was so mind boggling, even, you know, having not been a guitar player at that point, it just sounded like something impossible, but. And- and Hendrix is timeless. Yeah, Hendrix is, is timeless. I mean, his playing is timeless for sure. Yes. The, the, the songs and the albums now, it definitely has the, it, the, it's dated sounding. It sounds like the 60s, but, and there's nothing wrong with that because I love so much music from the 60s. But, but um, Hendrix is, uh, Hendrix is lead playing though. Like his, his solos, I mean, he really made the guitar sing like nobody else and he's still listening to him now and it's so good and and so, you know if, if if you could play that way now people would still be in awe that mm-hmm. you, you you play that play the guitar like it was meant to be played it's like stevie ray vaughn like stevie ray vaughn had and he was influenced by hendrix obviously but you know when you listen to stevie ray vaughn now even after even 35 years later you know stevie ray vaughn was uh so he had so much conviction on the guitar and his, his bends and his note choices. And it was all, it was all perfect. It sounded like, Oh my God, this, this guy is, you know, making the guitar, you know, he's speaking through the guitar. And to me, that's, um, you know, being a lead guitar player like that, that's always been one of the cool things about the instrument. Like you can, you can actually like, I can sing and I'm a, I'm a pretty good singer, but like I'm limited with my vocal range and I wish I was a better singer, but as a guitar player, I feel like there's no note I can't hit. You know, I, I'm, all I got to do is, 
is practice that instrument. You know, I'm not limited by genetics. All I have to do is, you know, practice the guitar and I can, I can make that thing sing as, as much as I want. And, um, that's the cool thing about that instrument. It, it actually has a lot of qualities of, of a human voice. Like you can, you can bend a note, you can put vib- vibrato on a note, you can hold a note out for a long time and, and make it, you know, sound like, you know, it, it just like it's soaring, you know, it's, and it's, a, it's, um, you can't do that on a, on a bass or drums and you can hold down a groove, but, but, uh, the, it's a very expressive instrument, you know. Do you remember? Uh, I, I love it. But do you remember your first riff? The first riff I ever I ever learned. Yeah. On a guitar, uh, <laughs> I think the I think the first riff I probably ever learned was much like a lot of old men my age was uh, was either "Smoke on the Water" or um, or "Stairway to Heaven." One of those. Two. Oh. It's, it's always one of those. You know, but uh, but then it soon went to you know, more, more difficult. So then I learned like everything, like everything that ACDC had, everything on back and black and everything on, uh, you know, power edge and everything on, uh, uh, highway to hell. And, um, you know, and, at you know, at, when I was starting the guitar, I didn't realize like, you know, I thought, you know, I thought, Oh my God, like Angus Young, he's so awesome. And he was as everybody in ACDC was, but I didn't realize, you know, so much of my, of the influence of ACDC and what I was learning, all the killer guitar riffs were, it was all Malcolm Young. Like Malcolm Young was, he's this underrated, he was this underrated, amazing guitar player who just stood back by the drums and, and wrote these amazing, timeless, you know, you know, guitar riffs, like all the ACDC stuff, stuff like, you know, Highway to Hell riff is like, everybody knows that, right? And, uh, and you know, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll, and, and uh, you know everything on on back and black. It's just like holy shit. And, <laughs> and the guy like never spoke at all. He just he just let his guitar do the talking. And a lot of people didn't even know, you know, they, they, you know, they didn't know the name Malcolm Young. But you know, I was talking about that with somebody today, like about how ACDC is uh, probably the most copied band in history. Like that, their sound, it sounds so simple to people. And, you know, when you play an instrument, you know, especially guys who grew up with that kind of shit, like you got to be a certain age, you know, yeah. these days they don't understand. But, you know, if you're, if you're old enough and you grew up with ACDC and, and heavy metal, like everybody who ever learned how to play guitar or drums, everybody, when you're, when you're first learning how to play your instrument, you, you, you think, oh, ACDC, that's, so fucking easy like anybody can play that shit right <laughs> anybody like i want to learn the hard shit i want to learn <laughs> i want to learn how to play rush or dream theater like everybody thinks that like the harder the harder stuff is like you know m- more notes and and uh you know complicated fast riffs and shit like that and then the older you get as a musician the more you like can go back to uh acd thing and go oh shit like those guys it sounds easy but it's it's all about the feel and it's like it's not just about the playing either. It's about writing. And those guys, those guys wrote these timeless, awesome songs. And, and uh, there's a lot of dudes that, that are, you know, you can go on YouTube and, and watch any nine year old play eruption now, but let me see those nine year olds, you know, write back in black. It's not going to happen. Right? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so I'm curious, tell me how to, a couple of things. One, how did metal school come together and how did you come up with the name? Well, you know, a lot of people don't know that, but before we were Steel Panther, we were we were uh, called Metal School for a little bit. And before we were Metal School, we were called Metal Shop. And um, we actually started started the band in in the '90s. And part of the reason why we did it was because um, we were uh, truly like appalled at, at the state of music back then <laughs> because you know there was they, all, all the bands were like you know on heroin <laughs> there, was no, there was nothing fun there's nothing fun going on and you know so you know re, the, really we put we put the band together and we, you know we had, we all loved metal we, we've all everybody in, in steel panther we love metal i mean we are truly metal to the bone if you if you could see 
Michael Starr, our singer, right now. I'm, I guarantee you he's wearing a headband, his hair is down, and he's probably, you know, like watching a poison video on his <laughs> iPad or something. But everybody loves metal, right? So when we started the band, you know, when we first started playing together, I mean, we were doing, um, we actually did Vegas. Like we did play the show in Vegas. And, um, you know, we were doing covers, like most, most, like a lot of bands, you know, you know, I always think it's funny because there's, there's, uh, you know, like there's people that criticize bands for doing covers, right? Like, like you should be. Absolutely. Should All the time. Sh- like you should, yeah, you should feel shame if you play cover music or whatever. Like, like you were, you're, if you're a musician, you should, you're born and then you pick up an instrument and then you write your your greatest album, like right out of the, like like fuck. Everybody's in a cover band at some point, right? So, you know, a lot of people don't realize. Van fucking Halen, they were the biggest heavy metal band in the world at one point. They were a cover band, okay? They were a cover band before they were a, an original band. So it was the Beatles. The Beatles cut their teeth as a cover band in in Germany, right? And and every band was a cover band. Any good band was a cover band, right? So and we played covers for many many years. And we started this cover band. And of course, we wanted to do metal. So we started playing in, in uh, Vegas and uh, we did all kinds of shit White Snake and Van Halen and Def Leppard and all and, the good uh, stuff. All, all the classics. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll be totally honest with you, we were a great cover band. As a matter of fact, we, we, we did so well as a cover band that, um, I mean, we, we made as much money as a cover band that as we ever made as an original band. So we used to pack places out of where we played. And, and, um, and so that was just basically what we did for a living. And, and, uh, and eventually we got so big as a cover band, you know, over the years, you know, that through, through the early 2000s, we started playing in Hollywood and um, the Viper Room. And then we did, San, we were doing San Diego. And then we were doing a lot of casinos, um, Vegas through the early 2000s as well. And um, just, just playing, just playing covers and really you know for us it was like when we started doing doing playing out um we knew we knew immediately when we stepped on stage together that we that we had a really great chemistry together and we were we were fun and um that was kind of the goal from the beginning like because there was not a whole lot of fun bands at that point there's a lot of like there was a lot of grunge bands you know the there's 90s. not a lot of fun bands now there's not a lot of fun bands now, and and I swear, like, the, you know, every once in a while I hear I hear people make comments. You know, I see people on on YouTube. I should never go on fucking YouTube <laughs> comment section because it what makes me want to pull my fucking hair out. Like the people that comment on YouTube, on on any comment section, any comment section, and you know, like they should all be kicked in the balls a thousand times. Um, but every every once in a while I, I hear a comment, I see a comment of you know like oh man wouldn't it be great if steel panther like just could wrote a serious song for once <laughs> and like well, i'm thinking to myself first of all how the fuck do you know we're not serious okay <laughs> right <laughs> that's totally subjective it's totally subjective how do you know we're not serious secondly like i how it doesn't the fucking world have enough serious bands like every agree fucking band Every band in the world is serious. Everybody thinks they're writing the most clever fucking shit. It all sounds the same to me, and it all bores me to tears. And, you know, I, I love to laugh. I, I, everything, to, everything that I see in life, if I don't make some, if, if you can't make light of it, then to me it's, it's just, you know, you're, you're living life too seriously. So, Correct. I, so you I, go ahead. I love to, you know, sorry, I love I love to bring you know bring the you know to me like when we when we started doing this band as a cover band as a group of guys we in between songs we you know there was a couple things that drove us one of them was we don't want to you know we're only making a hundred bucks so if we don't put more people into this club we're, we're going to lose the gig and then I'm going to lose my hundred bucks. So let's fucking do anything we can to entertain him. 
And so we, we just happened to have this really great chemistry where we could be really entertaining and say shit that was, was ridiculous and spontaneous, but still very funny. And we would just, you know, it was like, and it was like being in like groundlings or second city or some shit. So it was like, it was like having our own improv comedy troupe that had regular gigs. And, and, um, so the humor just developed like over, over, you know, gigs, gigs, uh, weeks and months and then, and then years. And, um, and then of course, for me, it was, it was, um, being, being a songwriter, it was like, Oh my God, we built, we built this, we built this great following of, of fans as a cover band. And, uh, it was like, uh, you know, um, I had other bands that, you know, I was in doing original music and I was like, why am I out there beating my head against the wall? You know, trying to, trying to force people to listen to original music. And I've got, I've got this built in audience with, with, uh, with, with this band. Why don't I just write original music for this band and, um, and really match it to what we do. Cause our, our humor was, you know, part, a big part of why people came to see us every week. Yeah, and and, so, and like, when you hear a Steel Panther song, you remember it. You can hear a lot of cover band songs, and Fleetwood Mac has a cover band. They make a, a tour out of it, so does you too. There's a cover band making a, a tour out of it. But when you hear those bands, you know the songs. You hear a Steel Panther song, you remember it. It doesn't just kind of like fade into oblivion with everything else. Yeah, I mean, well, it's and to me that that is like, that was a challenge, like like. In order to do original music with with this band, it was obvious that we had to do some we had to do shit that was totally irreverent, totally dirty, totally humorous. Because we were already, you know, we found what we did like before we were ever doing original music. It was like, oh, we, we this is our thing. We we entertain people. We're fucking. We got a great chemistry comedically. You know, I mean, before we ever did a, an original record, we had you know, we had a lot of people trying to get us, you know, on TV, you know, trying to get us, you know, movie deals and shit like that. Cause they were like, this is so funny. You guys are really funny. Let's, let's, uh, let's do, let's do some stuff. And, um, you know, breaking on, into that is like, it, it's not an easy thing because everybody wants to be on TV. Right. But, but, um, for me, uh, the next step was, was a no brainer. It was like, okay, I've written 300 original songs that nobody wants to listen to. Let me write, let me see if I can rise to this challenge of like writing, you know, writing songs for, for this band. And, and like the new challenge, you know, I mean, even back, even back in the early 2000s, it was like, okay, well, I could see where the music business was going. Like it was clear that in any, in a few years, nobody was going to be buying records anymore. Like everybody was going to get them for free. And, and it wasn't even about like selling records. It was about, for me, it was about let's take our band to another level. Let's, let's create something that, that, you know, nobody can copy. Cause you know, we were a cover band at the time and there was a lot of bands out there going, Oh man, these guys are doing really well. Let's do what they do. And they, and they were just copying everything we did, <laughs> you know, trying to go out there and be funny. And let me tell you something. It's, it's very difficult to, find a, a chemistry with people you can't just like throw four guys on stage and and have it be entertaining but a lot of guys tried so but uh you know i i love to write songs so for me it was like if i can just write the dirtiest words and 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 if i'm a good enough songwriter then the goal should be to make a song that's so hooky that that people can't help but sing the dirtiest words back to me. Like, like I want, like my dream was to be able to look into the audience and ha and see, you know, young girls singing the most foul language back to me. <laughs> and, you know, I remember like we did, a, we, the, the first CD we did was uh, we released it at when we were called metal shop. And um, there's probably still hundreds of those CDs out there. And they had, you know, some of the songs that were on our first, our first major album release. So, you know, it had Fat Girl on there. It had, uh, it, it had um, Stripper Girl. There were a few songs that made it to our first record. And I remember, like, we sold them from the stage at the Viper Room. And we sold, like, 
300 CD was like the first night we we, we brought on in. And, uh, That's big yeah, though. Like, oh, Back then, that was big. Hey. Yeah, when you're selling them out of the trunk of your car, yeah, <laughs> right. it's like holy shit, like <laughs> it was great. So, uh, but you know, for me, it was like, oh my god, like you know, we did we did that CD and and um, and it was it was like we started just playing those songs at our local shows, and we did that for a few years, and um, but it was great because people knew them and people would sing them back, and it was like, oh, this is awesome. And um, eventually we, uh, you know, I, I wrote some more songs and we, we, you know, we went through a couple name changes. We broke up with managers and they tried to sue us, you know, because that's, that's how the music business works. You know, you, you leave a manager and instead of them going, okay, well, it was nice working with you. They go, you can't work without me. I'm going to sue you. And then they try to sue you for every dime. You and they want to take your originals. And, well, they, they just want to take, they want to punish you. Like, yeah. like anybody, anybody who manages your band wants, they, they're just taking, basically taking a cut for, for doing nothing. Like you have to do all the touring, you have to do all the playing, you have to write the songs, you have to perform every night. And the manager just sits on the side, you know, sits at home and gets a check. And so when you dump them and they're like, wait, you're going to, you're going to cut me out and I don't get mailbox money anymore. Fuck that. I'm going to sue you. <laughs> but, but managers never win those lawsuits. They just do it to, to the apple. So, um, so we ended up, uh, leaving, you know, a couple of different managers around that time. But w- I remember, um, we, uh, ended up changing our name to steel, steel Panther, um, after we were in metal school and we were, we were, it was right around that time. Um, I had just finished uh, writing, you know, you know, like Asian Hooker and Community Property and and uh, and you know a, a bunch of songs, Turn Out the Lights, and and we were just recording a bunch of a bunch more songs for you know for for our fans, but then uh, we got an offer from Universal, and um, you know for it, it was kind of on the table for a while, and believe it or not, we were we kept on saying no, we were like because we had this wow. horrible this horrible manager that we were working with who was like, we're not, we're not signing record deals. We're going to do a movie instead. And, and we were just a bunch of dumb musicians going, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> you got universal and, on the but, table trying to sign you the manager going, no. Yeah. And other, and other bands yeah, out there yeah. dying to get an offer from universal. Oh, totally. Yeah. And we, and we were like, no, well, we were just like listening to him going, yeah, you're right. We're going to do a movie. And eventually, but eventually too much time had passed. And, and, um, you know, I was like, I had had enough. I was like, we need to dump this guy. And, and um, so we finally dumped him and, uh, and we, and the universal offer was still on the table. So we ended up um, changing our name and signing to universal around, in around 2008. And um, yeah, to steel Panther. Yeah. yeah. We changed it to steel Panther. We were still playing every week at the key club at the time on the sunset strip. And we were still doing San Diego every week. And, I think we were doing uh, Vegas, like maybe Green Valley Ranch or something like that. But then we signed with, with Universal, and uh, I mean, God, at that point, I was already an old man. I was like, <laughs> "You're only as like, old as I you don't... feel, Satchel." <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, trust me, I felt pretty fucking old. <laughs> but I was like, <laughs> I mean, at this point, I was like, you know, the guys. I'm like, oh, all right, well, that's cool. I guess you know, let's definitely do the record, and it'll be cool. You know, hopefully, it'll help us brand the band and, and get out there and, and you know then it was like okay the, we went over to england for the first time and like in 2009 because the album came out in 2009 and uh we went over to england and we like the first time we did da- there was a festival over there called download and um the download festival it used to be called monsters of rock like back in the 80s and it was, uh, you know, it's been going around, going forever. I think it started in like the early eighties and, you know, Metallica and, you know, Ozzy and everybody, every, everybody's played it over the years. And, um, the first time we played it in 2009, we were, um, our record had come out like three days before. And we, you know, we were on like, you know, I think the third stage or something. And, and we were, uh, we, we were driven to the backstage area in a, uh, in a, in a van and we got out of the van and, and we didn't know what to expect. We thought, Oh shit, there's going to be like 40 people in front of the stage. Right. 
but uh, we, we were backstage and, and we heard like like thousands of people and they were all chanting Panther, right? Was, Panther, Panther, Panther. And like, like it was like, oh, I started to get nervous. I was like, <laughs> my God, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> and like, we went out and it was like, you know, it was like, it was so packed. Like there was, it was like a tent and there was, you know, probably 10,000 people like lying out the door and, and it was just like, oh my God, this is like uh Adrenaline had to just be flowing. Yeah, it was like that was the first download experience, and it was like, oh my god, couldn't you know swallow? My mouth was so dry, and and, uh, but it was super fun, and and uh, of course, then you know that from that point on, like you know, England has been great for us. We we go over there all the time, and and uh, Germany's great, and everywhere. You know, Europe is it's a little bit different of a rock scene over there because they have a. They just have a, a big rock community. They have a lot of festivals everywhere in every country. So we go over there all the time and, and do festivals and, uh, you know, when there's no coronavirus. So, uh, <laughs> so for the listeners who may not know, Feel the Steel debuted at number one on the Billboard Comedy Chart in 2009 and Balls Out was number one in the UK in 2011 and debuted at number one in the UK iTunes Rock, which surpassed Megadeth 13 and Metallica's Lulu. Balls Out was also number four in the U.S. iTunes and number four on Billboard. And then you guys end up on tour, the Mirrorball tour with Def Leppard and Motley Crue. That had to be fun. Uh, yeah, that was that was fun. We had we had a great time with. Uh, I mean, it was only like a maybe a six or seven show tour. It was in the U.K. and um, it was uh, you know Def Le- it was Def Leppard's tour, and that was a blast. We had a great time. Motley Crue, it was us, and then Motley Crue, and then Def Leppard, and uh, Motley Crue like like didn't like us from the beginning. <laughs> they they were they were like like I think um, Tommy Lee tweeted like right before the tour he tweeted something, um, you know he tweeted like oh so much for no cheese on this tour, and he you know made, and he put a picture of glasses on it, and. Um, and I was like, I got really mad. I was like, oh, that fucking guy. So I tweeted him back. <laughs> and I was like. We got a Twitter war. <laughs> yeah, it was a Twitter war. It was, it was like two days before the tour started. started and I, and I, I wrote back and I wrote, I wrote, does that mean you're not going to play anything off your solo record? <laughs> to, to, to Tommy. <laughs> and, he was, and so we got into it. And then uh, the promoter, this, this guy, he's the guy, um, his name is Andy Copping. He's a super great guy. And um, he's the guy who does Download Festival and all this stuff over in the UK. And he he basically called Tommy and he was like, you know, he called the manager, their manager, and he was like, tell Tommy to stop that bullshit. And and so Tommy stops during the tour, and we both stopped, and and it was, uh, you know, it, it sort of was, was just quashed through the tour. But but I know I know Tommy like I know Tommy hates me, and and, and I hate him too. It's kind of cool. <laughs> And then you, you guys end up, uh, you guys opened for Guns N' Roses at one time. Um, we did. It was right after that, actually. It was right when we got back from the Jeff Weber tour. Did you get along with Guns N' Roses? Weird. Well, I mean, the, the guy, it, at the time, it was like, it was basically, it was Axel and then a bunch of other dudes, you know, I think, I don't I don't know, I think maybe Dizzy, Dizzy Reed was in the band at the time and, like, DJ Ashba, a bunch of people, it was like, it was we used to call it hired guns and roses because because uh, it was a bunch of hired guns. <laughs> like, but, but it was you know I mean there's been many incarnations of guns and roses through the years and, and uh, that was one of them. It wasn't I mean I don't think Slash was playing in that one, but you know they they sounded good. I mean to me the the, the problem with guns and roses like I, I love Appetite for Destruction. It's a great fucking record, you know. They deserve all the money they got from it. It's like 50 trillion records or mm-hmm. like or something. And that, it was cool being able to open up for them, except for the fact that it was so strange because, you know, we, we opened up for them in L.A. It was at the Forum. And we played L.A. every fucking week at that point. Every week <laughs> for, for years. And I swear to God, it was, we, when we went on stage, I swear... It was like going on stage in fucking Brazil. Like that's how few people knew who we were. <laughs> like, like it was amazing. It was like 
almost all Hispanic audience, like, and everybody's looking at us like, who the fuck are these guys? <laughs> so it was, it was weird. Like, we, it's our hometown, and nobody knows who the fuck we are. And people are like throwing fucking ampho light bottles out of the shit. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but we killed it. We killed it. It was awesome. And we, we were great. We only got to play for like 40 minutes or something or a half hour. But um, but Guns N' Roses, like, I mean, I did watch some of them that night and they, they sounded okay, but it was, they, they just, they play too long. They always have. Like, they, they go on and they play, I'm not kidding you. There was 35 fucking songs on the set list. Wow. And it's eight. Now, I don't care how big of a Guns N' Roses fan you are. You really want to hear 30 fucking five songs. No. I don't. <laughs> I don't not don't even not even the diehards probably want to hear 45 songs <laughs> in a night. Dude, uh, <laughs> no way. Dude, if, if you're standing up and somebody's playing 35 fucking songs, you're, you're there for three hours. Your feet are killing you. And if you're sitting down after 35 songs, your ass falls asleep. There's no fucking way to make it through 35 months. Something's so. falling asleep that night. Either you or a body part's falling asleep before that concert's over. Exactly. And, but, you know, it's funny because I saw Guns N' Roses at the forum during, I think it was on the uh, um, Use Your Illusion tour, and they went on three hours late. It was almost to the point where they canceled the show. And then they went on at like 11 o'clock at night, and and they played for three fucking hours. I was like, holy shit. Like, no fucking way am I staying up. I could, I barely made it to the end of the show. I was like, why am I still here? It's two in the fucking morning. And they're doing like, you know, the, the long version of fucking he- knocking on heaven's door. Like, the cover song. Right the 30 there. minute version that just keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they, they do that kind of stuff. People may not have known who you guys were then, but they they shortly did after that because your first solo tour in 2011 sold out basically pretty quickly, um, which is pretty impressive. And then you guys continue just been growing ever since. One of the things I'm kind of curious is, and <laughs> I can't wait for this answer is. How in the hell did the uh, STD tour name come about? Well, it was just it's natural. I mean, pretty much every tour is an STD tour. So, I mean, and basically, you know, we're, we're always on tour. So, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, every band, if, if you've got fans, you know, for, you know, for many, many years, like, it's always been, people, bands have always toured on the album cycles. You know, because that's, uh, that's how the industry was set up. You put an album out, and then you go on tour, right? Because, you know, and and for some reason it still kind of works that way because people still pretend that al- albums matter at all. Like, like we're going to put an album out. Awesome. And then we're going to go tour and support the record. But the problem is nobody gives a shit about your new record anymore. <laughs> like nobody buys it. Nobody fucking pays for records anymore at all. So a lot of times, like people don't even know you have a new record out. They just know you're, playing a show <laughs> so um you know when we named that tour the STD tour it was just it was just one of the many tours that we do and uh you know people ask us all the time oh what are you guys doing after the tour and i always think to myself what do you mean after the tour our tour <laughs> never stops we just keep the going only, yeah the only time I, our tour has has ever stopped is when there's a worldwide pandemic and nobody will book us. <laughs> like right like now. This is the longest, <laughs> the longest vacation I've ever had because nobody's allowed to be in the fucking room with another person. So. <laughs> but it's, um, it's you know, it's basically just tour after tour. And, you know, a lot of times you, you name your tour after the album that you that you just put out or whatever. And But, you know, for us, it's just like, oh, well, the last time we were here, our tour was a different name and we don't have a new album now, so let's just call it something else. And, you know, unlike a lot of bands, um, you know, we don't, I've never looked at our band as something that needed a record. We've, we've never needed records. Like most bands have to have records. Like, you know, you, you put a record out and then you play the material for people. And for us, you know, the material is, is totally secondary because what we're doing is a show every time. And it's always, a different show because we involve the audience and we always have a great fucking time and you never know what's going to happen. And that came from, from playing residency gigs for years. Like we did, you know, you think about it, we did 
every Monday night on the sunset, sunset strip for 13 years. So you guys Think have drawn. That. You got yeah, that's amazing. So you guys really have drawn right. from what you did then, still doing it now, just in a bigger platform. Yeah, well, it's just a bigger platform, and and the tour is a longer tour. But back then we were on tour too. We were just on a, a three day tour. It was Monday night at, in Hollywood, Wednesday night in San Diego, and Friday night in Vegas, and then we would start the tour over every week. But you know, when you when you have the same gigs every week. You know the the challenge is okay. Well, we have to have return, repeat cu- customers, right? So, like you're going to get the same people every week, and you can't do the same show. Now, I don't know about you. If you if you've ever been to most bands, it's the same fucking show every time. Like if you go see a tour, almost every band you see, they do they just play the songs, and they say the same shit in between the songs. And if you've seen it once, you've seen it. A right. Times. Yeah. No and matter what city us, you go to. Doesn't matter what city you're in. It's the same set. Got the the singer does the same shit. <laughs> People who play instruments don't say jack shit because you know they're they're not the singers. So they just stand up, stand around, waiting around to play the next song. And for us, you know, when when we were doing the Sunset Strip every week, it was like we have to make this show fresh every week. Otherwise nobody will come back and we will not have any money. So that was the goal. And, and, um, and somehow we were able to like keep it going for 13 years and we never lost the gig. It was like, so, so we became really good at, at making it fresh every week. Like, and, and that, that just comes from like, you know, basically not wanting to lose the money. And yeah, still, like yeah. Pressure there. And you're still going strong today. So for, <laughs> for so for Satchel, right. is it more fun on stage or backstage? Well, you know, backstage can be a a, a, a great time. But you know, to be honest with you, like, you never know what's going to happen backstage. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a great time, but and sometimes it's totally boring. But on stage, you know, for me, like, I feel very lucky because. You know, we've we've been touring for a, a long time now, and you get to meet a lot of uh, a lot of bands when you're on the road, especially when you're out there doing festivals. And and all, out of all the bands that that I've met, I, there's there really isn't any band that I know that gets along as well as as Steel Panther. And we really do truly love uh, you know playing together. And and every time we go on stage we actually have a blast. And, and that's something that a lot of bands can't say. I know a lot of bands that they don't like each other. They, they're on stage together. And that's the only time they see each other all day is when they go on stage together. And the rest of the time they avoid each other. And uh, You hear it yeah, all the time. Us, we, it's, it's, all, it's such a common, common thing. And I think it's so sad because, you know, there's so many musicians, you know, that would seriously cut off their left, testicle to just be able to make money playing music in a band and then you know you get this such a small percentage of guys that have this kind of success where you can actually tour and make a bunch of money playing music and then out of of those bands that have made it like almost all of them hate each other they all they all (laughs) they all don't get along Fans break up all the time, and, yep. they, and they throw it all they throw it all away because they 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 have egos or drinking problems or whatever the fuck it is, and and they've got the you know they've got they're living the dream they have it handed to them and they throw it all away because they're like fuck that guy I hate him and they can't look their singer in the eye or their guitar player or whatever the fuck it is, and for us you know you know it's not that we haven't had those kind of problems like like any band we've gotten to fu- we've had fights and shit. But we seriously, we went to like therapy. We went, we got, we got a family therapist. We learned how to talk to each other. You know, even though we're all different people and, and like we, you know, we have different opinions, you know, and, and we all have egos and all that shit. But, but we, we basically learned how to talk to each other like, like you would if you were married to each other. Yeah. You know? and, and, uh, and that's half the battles yeah. being able to get along. Exactly. Like, like once you can learn how to communicate and, and even though you don't like agree on things, you learn how to respect the other person's opinion and talk about things, talk about your feelings. I mean, there was a time when we would be on stage and, 
and me and our, our singer, we would like, you know, he would say something that rubbed me the wrong way. And I would like, I would be like, that was fucked up. And I would just, I would be a dick to him on stage and we would, <laughs> we wouldn't get along. It would, it would get really tense. Like, and it's really hard to be funny and having fun when you, you want to kick some guy in the balls. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we, we figured out how to, how to communicate and, and, you know, the last 10 years have been way easier than the first 10 or 12 years, you know? So it's, it's, it's all about communicating and, and appreciating, you know, the fact that you've got a band. I mean, you know, I can't tell you how many bands I, I've seen that have been like, oh my God, like they blow up, they got, they got, they, they're touring, they're making money. And then the next year they're, they're broken up and people are back to work in a guitar center or some shit. It's like, yeah, you guys have, understand it. you guys obviously, and you've, you've mentioned it a few times, I realize what kind of chemistry you guys have on stage and what kind of show you can put on. And instead of letting that all go, I mean, credit to, to the entire band of going, Hey, we're just not going to throw this away. We got to figure out a way to keep this going. And like you said, you get a therapist, you figure it out, you learn how to communicate and your things are going well and have continued to grow. It seems like. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, um, it is, it really is like, it's gotten easier the older we've gotten. I think obviously, you know, the, the older you get, I think the more you have, you know, that perspective and the appreciation for what you've got. And, um, you know, not to mention the fact that, I mean, listen, we've been together as a band for, you know, 25 years and that's longer than most bands ever Make not it. many, not many, and probably not most. Yeah. Most bands don't make it past the first six months. And if you do have any success, a lot of bands then break up after they become successful. And, you know, we're out there on tour and the majority of bands that we see out there have at least one or two members replaced. It's never the original lineup. It's always different guys. I mean, we're the same guys that have played on every one of our records. And I think we might be one of the only bands out there like that. You know, it's, it's very rare to find a band with all the original guys. So, um, and, and, you know, that's one of the discussions we had early on, especially when we first left our first manager and, and uh, you know, had our first lawsuit. Like you go through lawsuits, like managers try to sue you and, you know, take all your money. And, and, you know, we've always reminded each other, listen, as long as we stick together through, through this, you know, we're going to be okay. Like, cause we've got something special. We've got a good band and, and we've got a great chemistry and we work well together and um, nobody can take that away. It doesn't matter how many people sue you or, or whatever. Like, like, and there's going to be, there's pl- always going to be haters. You know, there's, pe- there's people every day that, that think we should all, you know, get hit by a bus and never, <laughs> never put out another record. But for every, for every hater that we have, for every 10 haters we have, we have at least two fans. And so we have a lot of fans. <laughs> right. Absolutely. It's good. It's, and, you know, and the people that think you're not going to put out another record, you know, so sorry for them. You got a new one out called Heavy Metal Rules. And, um, you know, things are going well for the band Steel Panther and Satchel. I got a couple more questions before I let you go and have some fun with sure. these. Um, what set of items could you buy that would make a cashier uncomfortable? Well, uh, ooh. That's a really good question. Um, well, uh, how about uh, peanut butter okay. and uh, dildos? <laughs> yeah, that would definitely make a cashier wonder. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know, I, don't know if, I don't know if you can get those at the same store, but I'm, I'm assuming you can somewhere. Probably somewhere. Yeah, somewhere you can, you can get those set of items. <laughs> <laughs> if you could have a song play every time you enter a room, what would it be? Every time I enter the room, yeah. Satchel um, walks well, in. I, I would, I would have it be "That's All But Metal" because that's, that's uh, you know, that, that pretty much sums up. Yeah, and it's, it's one of my favorite Steel Panther songs, and it's one, and it's our first single that we ever released, and it's uh, definitely one of our our anthems. You know, "That's All But Metal." That is awesome, Satchel. Anything else you want to add before I let you go? Yeah, uh, kids, don't don't forget heavy metal rules. Uh, come see, see Steel Panther when uh, when when everybody's all dead from the coronavirus. And <laughs> if you've survived coronavirus, count yourself lucky because there's millions that won't. And uh, come see us on our tour. Hopefully, we'll still be the original guys. We're all pretty old though, so somebody's bound to get taken out by this virus. I'm telling you right now. Um, 
but I hope to see you guys soon. And Tommy, thanks for having me on. And I uh, love you, man. No Thank problem. You. I appreciate it, man. Love you guys. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you to Satchel for being on today. Make sure that you share and tell everyone about the show. We hope you enjoyed Before the Lights podcast. For show notes, go to the website, beforethelightspod.com, and follow us on Instagram at Before the Lights Pod. The extra five, there's five extra minutes of the interview with Satchel located on the Patreon. Make sure you check that out also on the website. Thank you for listening to Before the Lights podcast. I'm Tommy Canale, and we'll talk to you next time.